and misunderstood. Call it the original Great Escape. On May 13, 1862, just over a year into the Civil War, an enslaved man named Robert Small, who later was a Confederate steamer in South Carolina's Charleston Harbor, set into motion a daring plan. He saw that the Confederate crew had left, and he knew that oftentimes they left for the evening not to come back until the next day. As his great-great-grandson, Michael Boulware Moore, explains, for Smalls and six other slaves and their families, the stakes couldn't have been higher. They knew that if they got caught, that they would be not just killed, but probably tortured in a particularly egregious and public manner. Disguising himself in the top hat and long overcoat of a Confederate captain, Smalls piloted the ship past Fort Sumter toward the Union blockade and freedom. It really blew people's minds because, you know, it just was beyond what people thought an enslaved person could do. Not every great story has to become a movie, but, I mean, come on. There's so many twists and turns in the story that will be just amazing. And how about this for a second act? After returning home to Beaufort, South Carolina, Robert Smalls was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, one of more than a dozen African Americans to serve in Congress during the period known as Reconstruction, when the formerly rebel states were reabsorbed into the Union, four million newly freed African Americans were made citizens. It was a time of unparalleled hope. Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates has produced a new documentary about Reconstruction, airing this month on PBS. When you look at the radical, amazing changes that happened within a few years of the demise of slavery. There was a type of irrational exuberance. Gates says Reconstruction is one of the most misunderstood chapters in American history. Black men could vote, and they were about to elect congressmen to represent the rest of the South. I mean, you go and you ask people on the street who the first black person was elected to the U.S. Congress, they're going to guess in the 1960s, 1970s, and they would never guess it was Hiram Rebels from Mississippi. Hiram Rhodes Rebels was born free and served as chaplain to black regiments during the Civil War. On February 25, 1870, he was sworn in as a senator from Mississippi, an office once held by Jefferson Davis, who left the Senate to become president of the Confederacy. It was a big national moment. Oh, it's a, a historic moment, and it's memorialized in the famous Courier and, and Ives lithograph that shows the first senator and members of the House of Representatives who were African American. The Bain's Printing House created this lithograph featuring the African American members of Congress, all of them Southerners, all of them Republicans, in 1872. Wow, look at that. Harvard University's Houghton Library houses one of the few known copies. When Frederick Douglass saw the portrait of Hiram Rebels, he said at last the black man has represented something other than a monkey. So some of these men, seven years before, are slaves. That's right, absolutely. There were only two of these men who were born free. It's the first time in this country, or really anywhere, that an interracial democracy was created. Columbia University historian Eric Foner estimates that about 2,000 African Americans held some kind of public office during Reconstruction. We tend to think of slaves as ignorant or unsophisticated, but, you know, they had been living in American society for their whole lives, and their parents had, too. The, the slave trade from Africa had ended long before. These people were Americans, and they wanted the same rights, the same opportunities as free white people had. How gutsy was it for these guys not just to try to be elected, to, but to get seated and to actually demand equality. Lawrence Otis Graham wrote a book about Mississippi Senator Blanche K. Bruce, who was born a slave in Virginia before becoming a successful plantation owner in Mississippi. Bruce and his wife Josephine were one of the wealthiest African-American couples in America and lived in this townhouse in an integrated Washington, D.C. neighborhood. 
This is someone who was in over their head. This was someone who, despite all the odds against him, um, succeeded enormously. The year he seated in the Senate, 1875, is the apex of black representation during Reconstruction. Seven House members and one senator. So that's the high point. Yeah, no, it is. And so, but he doesn't get to enjoy that high point for very long with his colleagues. When neither candidate in the 1876 presidential election secured enough votes in the Electoral College to be declared winner, a deal was struck. Southern Democrats agreed to back Republican candidate Rutherford B. Hayes. In exchange, the federal troops who had protected black voters were withdrawn from the South. Black voting rights were gradually stripped away, and black representation in Congress faded. Reconstruction was over, and the Jim Crow era of segregation began. For most of the... A deal was struck. Southern Democrats agreed to back Republican candidate Rutherford B. Hayes. In exchange, the federal troops who had protected black voters were withdrawn from the South. Black voting rights were gradually stripped away, and black representation in Congress faded. Reconstruction was over, and the Jim Crow era of segregation began. For most of the 20th century, Reconstruction was portrayed as a failure. This is how the South Carolina state legislature was depicted in D.W. Griffith's 1915, The Birth of a Nation. That movie, which cast the Ku Klux Klan as heroes, was a sensation with white audiences. President Woodrow Wilson even hosted a screening at the White House. And most schools taught Reconstruction as a misadventure at best. That's what I was taught in high school in the 1950s. Reconstruction was the worst uh, period in American history. It was a travesty of democracy. Black people misused the right to vote, uh, were not capable of uh, serving in public office. That, that was what was taught everywhere. For a young Henry Louis Gates, this was particularly painful. And a few black kids in my class would put the textbook up over our face and slink down in our chairs because it was all so embarrassing. But over the last 25 years, Reconstruction in some schools has been given a much fuller treatment. As soon as African Americans have the right to vote, they become a majority in several southern states. And in 2017, the Reconstruction Era National Monument was established in Robert Smalls' hometown of Beaufort, South Carolina. Just down the road, you can see the house he lived in as a free man and the church he attended. Alongside it is a bust of Smalls, the only known statue in the South of any of the pioneering black congressmen of Reconstruction. They were no different than other congressmen. They weren't all great geniuses, and they weren't uh, rabble uh, like you saw in uh, Birth of a Nation. Well, I think the black congressmen are worth studying not only in their own right, but as symbols of a very big effort in our history to make this an interracial democracy.